You're listening to a 58 Ember production. G I R L S C A M P S Girls Camp. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Girls Camp podcast. I'm your host, Haley Rawl. And if you are navigating a faith deconstruction too, or simply find yourself fascinated by Mormonism and religion generally, specifically where it can go off the rails, then you are in the right place. I was really surprised by the response to this week's submission box. We are talking about patriarchal blessings and over 700 people wrote in their stories and their experiences with getting a patriarchal blessing. I don't know why that surprised me so much. I guess my patriarchal blessing, I had just never really reflected on that much. But in preparation for this episode, I have reflected quite a lot and have lots of thoughts and feelings We have so much to unpack. So what we are going to do is I'm going to give a little patriarchal blessing 101 for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about. And for those of you who do know what I'm talking about, you still may learn a thing or two because I learned a thing or two as I was researching and preparing for this episode. And then I'm going to tell you the story of my patriarchal blessing. My blessing changed my life in a really huge way. So I'm going to talk about that. And then, of course, we will dive into the submissions, your stories of getting your blessings, what they said, what they meant to you. And surprise, surprise, some crazy things have been said through these patriarchal blessings. And yeah, like I said, like I always say here at the Girls Camp Podcast, we have a lot to talk about. So let's jump into Patriarchal Blessing 101. What is a patriarchal blessing? I'm going to read a quick little snippet from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints dot com, I think, dot org, dot com. I actually read quite a bit about what the church officially says about patriarchal blessings and then just tried to pull some specific sentences together that I think hits the main points. Every worthy baptized member is entitled to and should receive a patriarchal blessing, which provides inspired direction from the Lord. Patriarchal blessings include a declaration of a person's lineage in the house of Israel and contain personal counsel from the Lord. Put a pin in the whole lineage house of Israel thing. We're going to talk about that in a second. Those who have received a patriarchal blessing should read it humbly, prayerfully, and frequently. Only by following the counsel and a patriarchal blessing can one receive the blessings contained therein. Okay, so this next paragraph is super, super interesting. You can kind of see even in the official church literature about patriarchal blessings in this next paragraph That kind of circular thinking that we've talked a lot about on the podcast and just basically like covering their own asses, I feel like it says, while a patriarchal blessing contains inspired counsel and promises, it should not be expected to answer all of the recipient's questions or to detail all that will happen in his or her life. If the blessing does not mention an important event, such as a full-time mission or marriage, the person should not assume that he or she will not receive that opportunity. Similarly, the recipient of the blessing should not assume that everything mentioned in it will be fulfilled in this life. A patriarchal blessing is eternal and its promises may extend into the eternities. That paragraph there is basically saying you're going to get a patriarchal blessing and it's supposed to tell you what God wants you to know about your life. This is kind of the closest thing in Mormonism to like fortune telling you go to someone who is assigned over a certain region. So in my case in Utah, it was over like a stake, a handful of wards. And this person's calling is to be a patriarch. You go to them anytime in your teens, I think. You can go as soon as your teens, but into adulthood. You basically are getting a blessing where through the patriarch, God is telling you what's going to happen in your life. It really is kind of like fortune telling. You feel like you're going to go there and they're going to tell you what's going to happen, what, quote, blessings you're going to get. But I think it's really interesting that they make such a point to say, yeah, that is the case. But if it doesn't say something and then that thing happens, well, it's not going to mention everything. And also, if 
it says something and that thing doesn't happen, that doesn't mean the patriarchal blessing was wrong. That just means that that blessing will come to you eventually after you die. So kind of already, it's like, well, so is or isn't it going to happen? Anyway, the biggest thing here too is that they really emphasize that anything that your patriarchal blessing says you will get in this life is predicated. They really like that word in Mormonism. I don't know if other religions have the same keenness for that word, but everything that the patriarchal blessing says is predicated on you keeping the commandments, being a good Mormon person. If you don't do those things, then basically you have no promise of those blessings. The last thing I want to read is it says here as well that patriarchal blessings are sacred and personal. They may be shared with immediate family members, but should not be read aloud in public or read or interpreted by others. So I will be breaking that rule today. And as is often the case for me in preparing for these episodes, I was feeling a little bit nervous about talking about my own patriarchal blessing publicly about sharing specific lines, which I am going to share and just basically telling you a lot of things that my own blessing says. I was feeling kind of how I felt before I did the episode about the temple where I talked about what goes on in the temple. It was interesting to note because I didn't realize I still had some weirdness around the patriarchal blessing thing. It makes sense because similar to the temple, it's very ingrained that it is very sacred and very personal. And, you know, it makes sense that some of that is still left over inside of me. I also think that reading back through my blessing, there was still like this personal connection that I feel to it. Like not even this, this is sacred indoctrination, but kind of an internal sense of like, is this personal to me still? I don't know. It's been kind of a weird journey. Point being, the church emphasizes really heavily, do not share your patriarchal blessing with anybody besides immediate family members like your spouse, maybe your parents, and that's it. Let's talk quickly about the 12 tribes thing because a big part of the patriarchal blessing is being told which tribe you are from. Growing up in the church, I think I always just like, I don't know, I just never really thought about it. I was like, oh yeah, you get a patriarchal blessing and it tells you what tribe you're from and cool, you know, interesting. And it really, truly wasn't until I was digging into this for this episode that I was like, wait, what the hell is this all about? What does this even mean? And I still don't think I have my head entirely wrapped around this concept. So I'm just going to give a little overview about what this 12 tribes thing means, but it still just feels honestly quite bizarre to me. Okay, so the 12 tribes of Israel. This is something in the Bible. There was a man named Jacob, and at some point he changed his name to Israel, and he was given a birthright from his father, Abraham. And the birthright was actually supposed to go to the older brother, and there's a whole story about that if you want to look into that. But the birthright went to Jacob, then renamed Israel, and he had 12 sons, and his 12 sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. These 12 sons came from four women, two who were his wives, and then two who were his concubines, which, as I understand it, is essentially like a mistress. I don't know if there's a politically correct term for concubines in this day and age, sex workers. I don't know. But their names are Leah and Rachel, the wives, and then the concubines are Bilhah and Zilpah. So I'm surprised we haven't had a Bilhah and Zilpah running around in Utah. That feels like a Utah name gone wrong. But anyway, these four women had the 12 sons and they became the tribes of Israel. And then, of course, they continued to populate and create the Israelite nation. Now, when you get a patriarchal blessing as a Mormon person in this here day and age, you are told what tribe of the 12 tribes you belong to. But let me read this little excerpt from the church website again. 
When you receive your patriarchal blessing, the patriarch, through inspiration, will declare your tribal lineage. It's not like a DNA test. Your tribe isn't necessarily related to race or nationality. Instead, it's related to a set of spiritual responsibilities and promised blessings. It declares the tribe through which you will receive your blessings and bless others. So basically, it's not like, oh, you actually descended through this person. It's more so symbolic of your spiritual lineage. And then some people are not technically like part of one of the tribes, but then they are adopted in when they join the church and get their patriarchal blessing. So it's all kind of strange. I'm from the tribe of Ephraim, which almost everybody in the church is from. I think most people are either from Ephraim or Manasseh. From what I read on the internet, oftentimes people of Polynesian descent are told they are from the tribe Manasseh, but most people are from Ephraim with some, you know, random people that get told they're part of the tribe of Benjamin or Judah. There's just like sometimes random people get told they're from different tribes. This is where I just don't really get it and don't understand the significance of it, really. I never learned what my specific responsibilities were from the tribe of Ephraim, but actually I think maybe my blessing specifically says when it tells me. Let's see. Okay, it says, you have been blessed exceedingly to be of the spiritual lineage and tribe of Ephraim. With that marvelous blessing comes sacred and serious responsibilities It is from a sacred covenant, which began with Father Abraham and this lineage, that all of Heavenly Father's children will be given the opportunity to hear and embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with this lineage, it becomes your duty to present the gospel to all who will listen and hear. Okay, yeah. So I think Ephraim, the responsibilities of the people of the tribe of Ephraim is apparently to spread the good word of the gospel. So there you have it. That's all I'm going to get into with the 12 tribes thing, but I don't know. Could be a fun rabbit hole if that intrigues you at all. So let me tell you the story of my own patriarchal blessing. I was, I believe I must have been 17 or 18. Growing up in the church, it's like at some point as a teenager, you go get a patriarchal blessing. Some people got it much younger, some people a little older. And I was watching General Conference which is the church headquarters big meeting twice a year. And that was the year that the mission age changed for women. So women were not allowed to go on missions until they were 21 and they dropped that to 19. So I had never considered a mission, but I'm in high school going into my senior year. And I was kind of considering like, what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to go to college? I was really wanting to go outside of Utah. I was looking to apply to a bunch of schools outside of Utah. And that was kind of my plan was I'm going to go to college outside of Utah and probably study English literature, see where I ended up. I'm watching General Conference. The mission age changed. And all of a sudden with that age change, I thought, oh, maybe I could go on a mission. I don't know. I had never thought about it. I never thought I would go. But with the age change, I was considering it. And as I was kind of considering that possibility, I decided to go get my patriarchal blessing. And there's not much you really do to prepare for that. You just like tell the stake and they coordinate it. I went with my mom. I believe that I had a short little conversation with the patriarch. I can't remember exactly. And I also don't know if my mom spoke with the patriarch before my blessing, like on the phone or something. But anyway, I go to get my patriarchal blessing and in my patriarchal blessing, it's actually right after those lines I just read you about my spiritual lineage from the tribe of Ephraim. The very next line says, your father in heaven desires that you fulfill a full-time mission by giving a precious year and a half of your life to share this priceless message of hope and salvation with those who are waiting specifically for your voice. Prepare yourself, therefore. Study, pray, and establish a close and eternal relationship with your Father in heaven. Rely upon him and your Savior, Jesus Christ. As you preach the gospel, you will have a powerful influence in the lives of many. You'll be an example to your fellow missionaries. It goes on. Uh, I bless that that service will bring you a great deal of joy and will bless you throughout your life and indeed throughout the eternities. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I get a little shiver down my spine when I read that now, like even reading that out loud is kind of feeling a little crazy to me, 
which is so crazy. The psychological hold when even rationally, I know that this is not real to me at all anymore. It still has this weird hold on me. Ugh, it's weird. I think part of what's so weird about it is because when I heard that at that time, I took that so literally. That was literally, I'm not kidding. That was as if God himself, as I perceived him at the time, had come to me almost in person and said, hey, you need to go on a mission. Like that's what you need to do with your life. You need to go on a mission. And not only do you need to go on a mission, but you need to prepare to go on a mission. And so the rest of your life leading up to the mission should be in preparation for going on a mission. I just was like, okay, that's what God wants me to do. Of course, I'm going to do it. I can't imagine not having done that with where I was at at that point in my life with how, again, literally I took this. So from that point on, from getting my blessing, I decided, okay, I'm going to go on a mission as soon as I can, as soon as I turn 19. That gives me one year of college before my mission. So I'm going to go to BYU because I think BYU will best prepare me to learn the gospel, to be a better missionary when I do go because BYU is cheaper and closer to home since I'll be going elsewhere for my mission. And so the path of my life was shaped even beyond my mission, which is a huge life-changing event, 18 months for me in a foreign country doing free service for the church. Even beyond that, it also shaped a lot of things surrounding that event because I applied to BYU, got into BYU, went to BYU, went on my mission, met Bentley, married him. Like so many things I feel like really hinged on that direction. And who's to say if my patriarchal blessing said that or didn't say that, if I would have gone or not, I don't know. Maybe I still would have. But I do remember I was talking to Bentley about this. I remember I was with a group of friends I made pretty soon before I left on my mission. And they were like 22 year olds at the time, a group of guys. So they were all return missionaries. And I think they were kind of jaded because their dating pool got really screwed over by the mission age change because as soon as they got home from their missions, so many women were leaving on missions like all the way back to age 19 that they kind of just like, I think were jaded by that because they felt like their dating pool was again, getting kind of ruined by all these Mormon girls going on missions. And I was talking to one of them and I told him, you know, I'm going on a mission. And he was like, well, why? And I said, well, my patriarchal blessing says so, like God told me to. And I remember he pushed back on me a little bit. And it was kind of in this way, I think it was coming from a place of A, he had been on a mission and he was like, you have no idea what you're getting into. And I think because I was a woman, he was like, I would never have gone if I didn't have to as a man. Anyway, he was kind of like, well, I don't think that's a great reason to go. Like, I think you should want to go. I wouldn't just go because your patriarchal blessing says you should. But in my mind, I was just like, well, who even cares if I want to go? And I do want to go because that's what God wants me to do. Like, of course, I want to go because I just want to do what God wants me to do. And that was the only time I think I ever took a tiny, tiny step back from my patriarchal blessing to think like, wait, do I actually need to do this? But then I was just like, yeah, no, I do, because God told me to. So that is kind of a crazy thing to think about. And it's kind of crazy how big of a piece in my own story my patriarchal blessing is in that way. I want to read a few more things from my patriarchal blessing just to give people a little flavor of what types of things these say. I think this is the first time I've reread it. I had to go dig through all my mission stuff in order to find my blessing. And I don't think I've read it since leaving the church. So this is my first time rereading it. And there's just a couple of things that were having me feel a little weird. And then some things that are kind of funny. So there's a paragraph about how I have been blessed with a good mind and many talents and abilities, which your savior expects you to use in building the kingdom, in performing the sacred duties and responsibilities, which you now know about and for which you can prepare yourself. Um, let's see. Oh, you will be called to positions of responsibility in the organizations of the church. Your leadership abilities will be expanded and developed. You will be able to give counsel to others. You will have the opportunities to use your special talents to further the work 
and build strong testimonies in others around you. I just read that to Bentley (laughs) before I started recording and Bentley's like, oh, you're doing that just in the opposite direction. You're just sharing your testimony in the exact opposite direction. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of funny that that got a little flipped on its head as far as leadership opportunities in the church. My blessing, okay, so this is going to be a little bit of an embarrassing confession, but when you get engaged in the church, I feel like it's pretty common that you sit down with your fiance and read your patriarchal blessings to each other or with each other. And I remember when I read my patriarchal blessing to Bentley and I read Bentley's and I was kind of like, hmm, like Bentley's felt not as cool as mine did. And I remember like clocking that and noting that because I feel like my patriarchal blessing really hyped me up. There was a lot in there. Oh, this was the other thing I wanted to read. It says, you were one of the truly faithful daughters in the pre-mortal existence. You stood firmly in support of Heavenly Father's plan, which provided for our Savior Jesus Christ to come into this world and atone for us. You rejoiced, and because of your splendid conduct in the pre-mortal world, you became worthy of many precious blessings, which you would receive throughout mortality. There's also another line kind of like that. It says, you have the gift of faith, if you will live for it, and even the gift of knowledge of the truthfulness of the gospel, and you will be unshakable, unflinching in your devotion to the things of the gospel, to your Savior and his sacred work, and to all things pertaining thereto. Hmm. So those obviously did not come to pass either because I didn't keep the commandments that those blessings were predicated upon or because it's all a crock of bullshit. The reason I mentioned those lines though is because Bentley's blessing was a lot more, a lot less personal. It felt a lot more general. It was shorter too. It just was like less powerful and impactful in the way that I felt like mine was. And like I said, I remember at that point, like it wasn't like I was going to break up with the guy over it, but I remember kind of being like, hmm, like, wow, like my blessing's pretty special. Like, hmm, I didn't realize how special my blessing was (laughs) because I hadn't read anyone else's blessings at that point. And that in and of itself is just shitty to even be comparing things like that as if if there were a God, he would care to give someone a more special blessing than another. In my mind, it ultimately just comes down to patriarchs and the way that they give blessings more than anything. But I think part of what has come up for me with the blessing thing, which I was talking about a little bit earlier, is mine really felt (laughs) which is so funny because now I'm obviously like, yeah, of course, it's telling you that you're like such a badass for the gospel. But it felt really, really important to me because it was telling me like I was such a badass for the gospel and I wanted to hear that and I wanted to be that. And so I think it was a really big deal for me because of some of the things that it said. And yeah, I think for a long time as I was deconstructing I would think about my patriarchal blessing. And I think for a long time, I kind of saw it as, okay, maybe there's some element of intuition on behalf of the patriarch, not the priesthood and the authority, but just like some intuition thing of like, they're putting their hands on my head and they're sensing something about me and my purpose in this life. And I wasn't taking it super literally, but I kind of saw it that way. And now I just think that the patriarch just based on their small interaction with you and with your parents and what's going on at the time, such as the mission age change, they just say some things. (laughs) And, you know, maybe some of them say drastically different things for different people. A lot of them say very similar things, which we're going to talk about, but I just see it as essentially inconsequential and made up, I guess. And that feels honestly kind of sad for me because even reading my patriarchal blessing back, I'm like, man, that felt good to feel like God had given me some really specific insight into who I was before 
this earth and who I am now and what my purpose is. Mine actually talks, there's a whole paragraph where it says you will live in other cultures and spend a lot of time in other cultures teaching people about the gospel. And that was really meaningful to me because I was like, oh my gosh, where am I going to live and what am I going to do? And anyway, it's, it's sad. And I've had a little bit of mourning and grief over the fact that I've never really sat down and confronted like, I just don't think any of this is real. But that said, I know there's a lot of different ways to relate to those spiritual experiences and those meaningful moments. If you did feel seen and understood in your patriarchal blessing, I don't think there's any wrong place to land, but that's where I've landed. And I realized as I was kind of like revisiting that, I'm like, I just don't think I can say like, oh no, there was something intuitive about this because it's like, I don't know. I just it doesn't feel good to me right now to like pick and choose. Like, well, that was really nice to me. So I'm going to say that, and it's not like it was even that nice to me. Honestly, it was just telling me to preach the gospel and give my whole life for the gospel. But I don't know. I guess I'm kind of at a place now where I'm like, I just don't think any of it's really real. Anyway, let's jump into your stories because, oh my gosh, there are some wild stories. And I learned a lot about the possibilities of patriarchal blessings and some of the things that people had said to them in these blessings are just wild. So let's get into it. Someone says, one evening, my parents went out to dinner and I snuck into their room. I was going through my mom's nightstand being a nosy 14 year old. And I came across my mom's patriarchal blessing. I knew how personal and sacred they are and went to put it away when I decided I would just skim over it. I was naturally curious as I had just gotten my own patriarchal blessing. However, I quickly came to realize that her blessing was almost verbatim to mine. From start to finish, we had near Nearly the same blessing. We had our blessing done by the same patriarch 20 years apart. I would say that was the moment I realized it was all a lie. Bless this little 14 year old's heart. Reading the blessing, knowing you probably shouldn't, feeling like you shouldn't, and then that sinking feeling of, oh, I thought I got this really special insight from an all powerful God about me and my life. And even 20 years ago, my mom was told the exact same thing. That has to really, really hurt. Honestly, good for you for having the wherewithal to not talk yourself out of it and just be like, hmm, something is not right here if they're saying this is such special revelation. And in reality, this same patriarch just is probably giving pretty much the same blessing to anybody who comes through. Interesting for the mom, though, because I wonder if when the mom, oftentimes the parents are there. So I'm assuming her mom was there for her blessing. I wonder if her mom was like, hmm, this sounds quite familiar. But there were so many stories like this. I'm going to read one more. I was in a singles ward when I received my patriarchal blessing. One night, some friends and I were discussing our blessings in further detail, and we slowly recognized we each had almost verbatim the same blessing from the same patriarch. There was about 10 of us in the room, and six of us had damn near the exact same blessing. Red flag. Yeah. Again, what a sinking feeling to be like, sharing little details about this personal special thing and then be like, wait, mine said that exact same thing. And 60% of the room had pretty much the same blessing that promised the same things. And it makes sense because a lot of things these blessings say are pretty generic. It's usually going to say you're going to marry a worthy person in the temple and you're going to have kids and raise them in the gospel. Like there's kind of this formula of some pretty basic promises that you get in those patriarchal blessings. And it sounds like these patriarchs were just kind of phoning it in, which I'm like, come on, if you're a patriarch, I don't know what that experience is like. That would be a really interesting experience because you're supposed to like really be getting such direct revelation from God but you think that these guys would at least get a little more creative in some of their blessings. But, you know, it's kind of like a horoscope where you can't get too specific because then it's not going to happen. So you have to keep it general enough that like most people are going to be like, oh, yeah, my blessing came true. Anyway, that would have been an icky feeling. And 
Yeah, that patriarch was just rattling off the same old blessing, it sounds like. Okay, next one. My dad and I got our patriarchal blessings two weeks apart from each other. I was 14, and my dad is a convert, and he didn't think about getting his until I decided to get mine. But we both got ours from the same patriarch. In mine, it tells me I will have a child that is a, quote, special gift from God, and that I will, quote, recognize that child as it becomes a part of my family unit. My dad got his two weeks later, and his mentions me by name name and says he will have a special relationship with that same child. As a teenager and turning into an adult, I've been terrified about what that means. Will the child die early? Will they experience addiction like my dad and that's why they have a special relationship? What does it mean? It gave me so much anxiety as a teenager and young adult. I was terrified of ever getting pregnant and still have deep fears this might happen to me. I'm now 30 and it still haunts me. I've never really wanted to have kids and after getting married, we decided together we do not want to have kids. My husband and I have been married for three years now and while my mom knows we don't want kids, my dad still bugs me about it like he's wanting me to fulfill this prophecy. Sorry, dad. I guess you'll never know. LOL. Okay. So 14 year old gets a blessing, mentions this particular special child, and then dad gets a blessing. And the patriarch says that grandchild of yours. So the child who got their blessing, their child is going to be very special to you too. Yikes. Yeah. Very stressful. I think this is a common theme in blessings too, where the patriarch will say something kind of vague, like you're going to have this particular child. There's going to be something about this kid. And as a human brain tends to do, you're probably thinking like, well, what? Like that's pretty ominous more than anything and frightening to be like, well, what's going to happen to my child? Is something bad going to happen? And then really stressful and weird. I've never heard of anything like that to have that added layer of now dad is going to want you to have a kid because he feels like that's part of his life journey that was promised to him is to have a special relationship with your own child. Lots of messiness there. Weird stuff around agency too for a church that is very, very into we all have free will and agency to make our own choices. Having those connections of like, yeah, The girl who got her blessing can still choose if she wants kids, but then it's affecting her dad's path because this kid was supposed to be so special to her dad. Things just get very weird and very intertwined. Next one. My patriarchal blessing said something like, quote, the Lord is pleased at your commitment to maintaining your sexual purity and promises blessings as that continues or some sort of bullshit. That moment is seared in my memory because one, I was super uncomfortable with some old man I'd never met before talking about my sex life when I was a 17 year old. And two, I'd been having regular sex with my high school boyfriend for a couple of years, which tells me that if there is a God and he is talking to this old fart, he knows that I had zero commitment to quote, maintaining my sexual purity. So either this dude is a perv or this whole thing is bullshit. Yeah, (laughs) I can only imagine God's like, oh, you're doing such a good job at maintaining your sexual purity. I know that's really important for you. And you're like, "Mm, just fucked my boyfriend, actually, a couple nights ago. So (laughs) either God doesn't know or the patriarch isn't getting the right message or as this person suggested, it's all just a little bit of bullshit. I found this story and a lot of these stories kind of healing and helpful for me because it helped me just remove some of those layers of weirdness I had around my own blessing. Like I didn't get a special right blessing from God because there's so many people who got these blessings that just said things that were just simply not true or you know what I mean? Like I know that rationally, but just hearing story after story where that was the case, I'm like, it's okay. It's okay to release the weirdness around patriarchal blessings. My patriarchal blessing described me as a quote, special young woman. My ex-husband's blessing said he would marry a quote, special young woman one day in the temple. He used this as evidence that God wanted us to be together. I was 18 and somehow believed it, even though that's the most generic phrase ever. And of course, it was the same patriarch who gave us our blessings, so the similar verbiage makes sense. We divorced four years later when I realized the church wasn't true, and he said he didn't want to have kids with someone who wouldn't instill gospel values. Well, bye-bye to that ex. I'm sorry. 
that's shitty. And wow, yeah, special young woman. That's the kind of lingo that is very common in these blessings. You will meet a special young woman or a worthy priesthood holder is what mine said. And they will take you to the temple to get married and have kids. But you can see how that can get not only manipulative to you personally, but that can get manipulative when people like this man were like, oh, special young woman. I've been looking for that quote, special young woman. And apparently you're it because that's what your blessing says. And if you're taking that literally, that's not a big jump to think, oh, this is the sign that God is giving me to get married to this person because of this coincidence, essentially in that one little phrase. And, you know, people's whole lives are affected. Like this person said, she married the guy because, I mean, I'm sure not just because of that, but that was something that contributed. And that's just icky and a bummer. I think the patriarchal blessing thing is really, really spiritually manipulative. I use that phrase a lot, but I think it is because it is told to you that this is the most specific insight you will ever get. Kind of like the closest thing, again, you can get to like talking to God besides obviously like through prayer and stuff, but it's not even like you could just like pray and God would be like, actually, that was wrong in your patriarchal blessing. Like it feels pretty set in stone, at least it did for me. And so it makes sense that it has that added layer of impact that is just kind of dangerous, in my opinion, and can lead people down different paths just based on this one thing, this one blessing that, you know, as we're finding out, a lot of these just said the same thing. Like they didn't really mean anything, but we thought they did. And that sucks. Okay, next one. My husband's patriarchal blessing says that his wife will die early and that he will spend the last little while of his life taking care of her. Can you imagine? Can you imagine meeting your husband? You get engaged. Maybe you read your patriarchal blessings together once you're engaged or maybe after you're married and you're like reading through his patriarchal blessing and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, your wife will um, die early and you will spend a good part of your life taking care of her. And you're like, um, what's going to happen to me? A, I'm going to die early. That's so scary to tell anybody that their partner will die early and then to be that partner and be like, okay, so I'm going to die early. And also to say that they'll need to be taken care of for a long time. So then you're assuming like illness or accident. So scary. I can't imagine. Also, what if you were dating this person, got engaged, and then you read that And then you're like, wait, I don't want to marry you because I don't want to be your wife if your wife is going to die early. Like, ah, that's crazy. Okay, next one. My true believing Mormon twin sister's patriarchal blessing says that someone close to her will leave the church and it will be her responsibility to bring them back. Well, I've left the church and she won't stop sending me conference quotes, scriptures, etc. Ugh. Ooh, yeah, that's not fun if you have left the church and on top of already the conditioning of people around you to want to bring you back into the fold, of course, this twin sister is going to be like, oh my gosh, the prophecy is coming true of my patriarchal blessing. It's my job now. I have been foreordained to bring my twin sister back to the church. Of course, she's not going to give up and that's going to be a huge strain on a relationship and that just is very, very unfortunate. I'm really sorry, especially your twin sister. You know, I have a very special spot in my heart for twins and twin sisters, especially because of my twin girls. So I just hate to think that the church could get in the way of a twin ship of a special twin bond. So hopefully it doesn't get too out of hand. Next one. I'm a post-Mormon, college-aged woman. I was 14 years old when I got my patriarchal blessing, and my dream was to become a professional dancer. I was so passionate about dance, and I couldn't imagine my life without it. In my blessing, it says, quote, direct your future education in a manner that will bless your future family more than anyone else. Spend time learning skills that are necessary in the home. Learn how to cook and clean. 
I interpreted that as I had to give up my dream of dance in order to be the best mom and wife for my future family. It was the hardest realization and biggest betrayal of self I had ever experienced. Since leaving the church, I've allowed myself to pursue that dream again. I got accepted into my dream school for dancing, and I am on track to dance professionally. I no longer have to repress my heart's truest desires and can be my true self. (sighs) That is so emotional for me because... I don't know. I feel like with stuff like this, I guess I just see things sometimes now through the lens of like the comments that I know I'm going to get when I, if I post like a reel about this story and I can already see the comments flooding in and it's people saying, well, you just took it too literally. Well, you could have just, you know, studied education or childhood development and been a dancer, like blah, blah, fucking blah. I know that a lot of times I think that's the defense mechanism of people in the church is like, you just took it too literally. You just took it too seriously, which is funny because they also like to tell us that we didn't take it seriously enough. And that's why we've left. Anyway, this just goes to show like for so many of us, this was so real. And if you were told as a young girl, you need to study something that's going to make you be a good mom it makes so much sense that you would take that literally and think like, well, I guess I can't be a dancer then. And I think it shows that. And then also just makes me so happy that this person, it wasn't too late and they get to be a dancer and they get to go and fulfill that dream and fuck what the patriarchal blessing says. I'm just so happy that, you know, that betrayal of self I think is so real and to be able to reverse that is really huge and really exciting. And I'm so happy for you. Also, can we talk about going to get a patriarchal blessing, being a young teenage girl? What does God have to say to me? And what God says to you is, quote, learn to cook and clean. I would be raging. I would be raging. I don't know if when I was 14, I would be raging, but I just can't fathom being like, what is the special insight from God about my life? And he's like, oh, learn to cook and clean. I'd be like, "Mm, that's what the all-powerful God of the universe, that's the message that they want to bestow upon me is to learn to cook and clean. Also, I highly doubt, highly doubt you would ever find a man whose patriarchal blessing says, quote, learn to cook and clean. Okay, next one. Mine said multiple times that I would be very sick, but would be able to be healed. I can't even tell you how stressed I was as an anxious teenager hoping to hear about her life's course and to get that as an answer. I distinctly remember him saying, quote, you will live a, insert world's longest pause, relatively healthy life. At the end and being like, WTF, I was so confused and already so anxious about the future. Thank goodness they only come true if you live the gospel. (laughs) That's true. That's a good loophole. If your blessing says you're going to be sick your whole life, but the blessing also says you have to, you know, keep the commandments and stuff for the blessing to come true, then it's like, oh, I don't want to be sick. So I'm not going to keep the commandments and stuff and then I won't have to be sick because apparently the blessing only happens if you do the things that the church says you have to do that's a smart one um I can't imagine being told I was going to have significant health problems in my life that's so icky and unfortunately very common not only did a lot of people write in something similar to that I have a close friend whose patriarchal blessing mentioned something about I think about her body specifically and says like you will have ailments of the body, things like that. And she's told me it's given her major, major hangups even to this day well out of the church because she had just really conceptualized her body as something that was like broken from such a young age because of her blessing. I hate that so much. Here's another one like that. My patriarchal blessing blessed me with the ability to be healed just like the other one. It really emphasizes the fact that at some point in my life, I'm going to get extremely sick and rely on the priesthood to be healed. Leaving has given me a lot of anxiety. I feel like I won't be worthy when the cancer or whatever terminal illness it is comes. So I will die when I could have been saved. I'm so sorry. And I am here to tell you 
that that's not going to happen to you. And I'm sorry that anybody ever made you feel like it was going to. That's just such clear cut fear mongering to tell someone, yeah, you're going to get sick. So you better stay in the church because when you get sick, you'll need to be in the church in order to get healed from your sickness. That's so gross and so wrong. And again, I'm really sorry. And I just want to say, I do not believe that that is true. And, you know, I don't know how intentional some of this is, but it definitely feels like some of these messages were kind of designed to get people afraid, ultimately, to leave the church. And we hate that around here. We do not like that. Okay, next one. This story is so Utah coded, but I worked at a popular sales company in Provo and my coworker literally said, my patriarchal blessing says I'm supposed to marry someone with the name Ashley and then smiled at me. My name is Ashley. I've literally never gone on a single date with this man, but how weird and scary, LOL. That's so gross. And I'm sure he thinks that's like the funniest pickup line because I highly doubt I mean, I know, I think I know that they don't actually say names of who you're going to marry, but he probably thought that was like a funny thing to say, like a cutesy little pickup line. It's not. It's not a cute pickup line at all. I had my returned missionary beg to read my patriarchal blessing. When I told him I didn't want anyone reading it who wasn't my husband, he reassured me that we, of course, were going to get married. After much hesitation on my end, he read it, and he broke up with me two days later. His said he would change the world with his music, I roll. Mine didn't say anything too cool or crazy. I guess I wasn't going to be a world changer, according to my patriarch. The last time I checked, he isn't touring the world either, lol. Not this being me to Bentley when I first read his. <laughs> I'm like, um, yours doesn't say you were one of the truly faithful in the pre-mortal existence. Like, yikes. <laughs> That's so crazy that he was vetting you based on your patriarchal blessing. That's what's so silly about the comparison, too, is like I said, it has everything to do with just the patriarch you have. Like they very clearly just have an MO about the types of things they say. It sounds like some of them might get like actually more personal information about like who these people are like his mentioned music I guess and use more personal information which if they were smart they all should probably be doing that because then we would probably believe it more anyway that's so dumb and also so funny because I don't know if that guy's changing the world with his music yet but we should check in and see if we can debunk his patriarchal blessing too. Next one. My patriarchal blessing specifically said I would serve an 18-month mission and should, quote, prepare immediately. That sounds familiar because mine said pretty much the exact same thing. I was devastated as I had zero plans to serve, nor did I want to. I went on a mission and I got so sick from anxiety, I was sent home early. Once I came home, I was judged for coming home early. No one from my mission would acknowledge or talk to me since I went home early and didn't return with honor. I would never have went had it not been for that, quote, revelation from my patriarchal blessing, nor would I have gotten so mentally and physically ill. It is still something that hurts me to think about. (sighs) That's the thing too. Like mine told me to go on a mission. I don't know how sad I am that it told me that because I think I am glad I went on a mission in a lot of ways. I think it was maybe not even a net positive, but for me, maybe it was a net positive. Like I'm glad that I went ultimately, but I know that that is not the case. So validly so, obviously, for so many people. And I can't imagine if my blessing had told me to go and I had this experience based on just factors outside of our control. You know, so much of a mission depends on where you're called to and what your companions are like. And a lot of, you know, how people fare on a mission, I think is truly just luck of the draw of where you end up. And then not only having to face the shame of all of that, but also just being like, I didn't want to go anyway. And why would my blessing tell me to go? And then the outcome be so bad. And then As always with these things, either you feel like there's something wrong with you that you just couldn't do it or you start to be like, wait, well, maybe I shouldn't have gone anyway. And then something was wrong with my blessing and therefore Mormon God, just all really complicated and super hard. I'm really sorry that that still hurts to think about, but that makes so much sense that it would. Next one. I have infertility, endometriosis, PCOS and low egg quality. In my early 20s, I had many miscarriages. 
But my patriarchal blessing said I would make our home a joy to be in for my husband and children. So I knew I would have babies that made it earth side. We now have three little girls thanks to modern medicine, not my obsessive behavior of being quote righteous enough, but I can't even begin to imagine the mind fuck it would have been if I'd never been able to have kids. So gross to fortune tell about such a sensitive subject. Yuck, big yuck, big, big, big yuck. I know for a lot of women, especially the kids thing was a big mind fuck, as this person said, because if it mentions kids and then you have infertility or you don't know if you want to have kids or if it doesn't mention kids and then you're worried you're going to have infertility or you're worried you're not going to be able to be a mom if that's what you want. That's just like this person said, we can't be telling women to have kids, to not have kids, to just like not mention kids. So then they're wondering if they're going to have kids or not. That whole thing is just a big yuck. And I think back to the paragraph at the beginning where the church website says, if the things in your patriarchal blessing don't come true in this life, they will in the eternities. And just how messed up that is too. Then you're just like, okay, well, my patriarchal blessing says I'm going to have kids. So I think I'm going to have kids, but maybe they're talking about kids in another life. Like after this life, it just adds so many layers to an already incredibly layered and complicated decision and situation. And it's not good to be doing that. Okay. Last one. I got my patriarchal blessing when I was 13. I was pretty young to have my entire life bestowed upon me by some random old man. My blessing was 20 minutes long and I was so overwhelmed that I went home and fell asleep around 2 p.m. and slept until the next morning. My parents told me it was just because the spirit was so strong, similar to what happened to Joseph Smith when he saw God in the woods. In my blessing, it said that I will stand at the right hand of God and lead the church in heaven with him. For some reason, I took this as... I'm going to be God's wife. I spent my entire adolescence thinking I was literally heavenly mother. Yes, I have gone over this in therapy. Bless you for having to hear that. Holy cow, I can't even imagine thinking that you are going to be God's wife. But literally that language, let's read it again. I will stand at the right hand of God and lead the church in heaven with him. This is the thing too, like that gets so tricky with all things church. And I was thinking about this when I was studying the whole like tribes thing that we talked about, like the spiritual lineage. There's a really fine line between symbolic and real and like spiritual and actual. And especially when you're 13 years old, to not fully understand that line. I mean, I didn't even fully understand it when I was a full grown adult in the church and then be given a blessing that says you will stand at the right hand of God. Of course, you're going to take that literally. And that's like really stressful and really overwhelming. My very small kind of inconsequential example of this actually have two. When I was eight years old and was preparing to get baptized, I remember this so vividly. My uncle at the time was my bishop and you have to go do like a baptismal interview. And I remember he asked me, do you believe that this is the one true church? And I said, yes. And I felt so sick to my stomach because I thought that church meant that church building, like that ward. And I remember thinking like, well, what about my grandparents? They're in a different ward. Well, what about like the friend of mine that's in a different ward? Like, how can this be the only true church? Like I thought, only those people that went to that building. That's what I thought he was talking about. But I was eight years old. So I was just like, "Mm -hmm, yep, yes, I do believe that this is the one true church. And I suffered over that a lot. I think I actually told my mom that and she clarified for me eventually. But that's kind of an example of like that mix up. I also thought that when we talked about Jesus getting resurrected and because he got resurrected, we could all get resurrected. I thought that meant we had to be crucified too. So people would be like, oh, it's so lovely. Like Jesus got resurrected so we can all do that. And I was like, I'm going to get nailed to a cross and I'm going to die by getting nailed to a cross and then I'll come back alive. I believed that like wholeheartedly, probably until I was like 10 or something. Those are very specific examples, but I think these things get just like complicated on a grander scale too, because then you 
I don't know. It's just kind of like you always have these weird ways out of like, oh, well, that wasn't literal. That's just spiritual or symbolic. Or if you take something as spiritual or symbolic, then they can be like, well, no, that was literal. Like you actually have to go on a literal mission, you know? Anyway, I'm glad that you're working through that in therapy. And I'm glad that you're not destined to be literally heavenly mother. Although I'm sure you do a great job at it. Thank you for going down the patriarchal blessing rabbit hole with me for listening to some of my patriarchal blessing and these stories. Like I said, there were so many responses to this one. So I hang on to all those responses. I have a lot of ideas for what to do with all of those responses because I feel like I'm sitting on just so much experience joint collective experience that we've all gone through with the church. But one thing I want to do is like a Girls Camp Greatest Hits episode where I just read like a bunch of submissions from different prompts. But I also want to revisit patriarchal blessings specifically because lots more stories where that came from. And yeah, I'm curious how it feels for the never Mormons out there because I think this will be a really kind of crazy one if anybody out there hasn't heard of the patriarchal blessing thing. And I'm also curious how it feels for those of us who have been Mormon or maybe even are if you're listening as a Mormon, because yeah, there's still a lot of secrecy wrapped up in the patriarchal blessing thing. But I have now read mine publicly to anyone who wants to listen to this episode of the Girls Camp podcast. So I think I've forfeited my blessings unfortunately. And hopefully I will not be struck down when this episode airs. But so far, so good. Have not been struck down yet, even though I've shared some sacred things publicly here at Girls Camp. And it just feels healing to be able to talk about this and to, yeah, you know, look at this not only for myself. I kind of had to face this thing for this episode, but also to feel like we're doing that together. I'm endlessly appreciative Thank you for listening. If you like the podcast, please leave a rating and review. If you haven't done so, that would mean so much to me. And if you have done so, thank you. I treasure every kind word set on those reviews. Follow me on Instagram, TikTok. I'm on YouTube if you want to follow me over there. And I will love you forever. And I do love you forever. Thanks for being here. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye. G-I-R-L-S-C This has been a 58 Ember production. For more shows, please visit the 58 Ember channel, 58ember.com, or find us at 58 Ember Media on socials.